Brett Allen here chatting with our very special guest today, Hannah Fry. And I'm excited about this because if you have followed her, her career, I mean, she's got videos on, on TikTok and Instagram, all over the socials. We're talking math and a brand new project on Bloomberg TV on the 22nd. So just in a couple of days, the future with Hannah Fry. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, no, the pleasure is all mine, Brett, believe me. Well, I'm excited because this is a little bit different than what you normally do. My son and I watch your little short clips. We'd love mm. to talk about math and make it as fun as possible. Mm -hmm. But this is different because you are looking at different sections, different things, the future of things, so to speak, and how that correlates. When people have a chance to watch here in a couple of days, Hannah, what can they expect? Yeah, so the show, it's called The Future. Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, given the title, I'm looking ahead to what's what's coming around the corner. Um, and I think that that I, look, I don't think I need to tell anybody listening to this that technology is moving at an incredibly fast pace. You know, things are changing really, really quickly. And I think that actually sometimes there's a bit of a danger of it feeling as though technology is ha something that happens to us rather than with us. And I think that this show really was. Uh, a chance to take a moment and ask ourselves if we are happy with the trajectory that we're on, if we're happy with the direction that we're headed in. Because the thing is, is that, you know, the future isn't just something that just happens, right? It's not like this sort of, this, 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 like this presence that you have no control over. Actually, right. I think that we have a real hand in designing what it looks like. And so what I wanted to do with the show was to ask the big questions about technology uh, about the impact that it will have on us as society um, and but ask those questions in advance of the technology arriving. Yes, instead of being reactive, being proactive, I think is good. And it it is crazy. We're talking, we have these films like Megan about AI and dolls that can move and talk. And as silly and as pretentious as it might seem, that type of stuff isn't like really too far off, right? I mean, cell phones are listening to us. I, I think <laughs> we're constantly being monitored some way, somehow. Mm -hmm. Now, you cover a bunch of different topics throughout this series. When you're putting this show together, how do you decide where to start, what to cover, how much to cover? Mm, good question. Um, okay, so I think actually, I mean, I've been writing about this area, and uh, you know, I am a, a tenured professor in London in in mathematics. So I've been like thinking about this stuff for a really long time. So I definitely had some very clear ideas of topics that I thought were interesting places to explore. So one of the episodes, for example, is about technology that claims to be able to read your emotions based on the expressions that you're making with your face, mm. and. And that actually is something where the technology is there. People claim that the technology can do it. I think the science is a little bit shaky. I think it's a little bit more of like algorithms pretending that they're slightly better than they are. <laughs> um, I mean, imagine such a thing. Um, and uh, and But I also think that the impact that this could potentially have on society is a really dramatic one. So, you know, I go, get to go and meet a company in California who are using the 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 cameras that are now built into new cars pointing inward towards the driver um, and not just doing things like checking whether the driver is awake, right? And alerting the driver when they, they potentially fall asleep, but also doing things like reading the emotion on the face of the driver. You know, like we are entering a world, we're sort of sleepwalking almost into a world where we are setting the scene for companies to decide that they're not going to allow us to drive cars when we have road rage, right? Or, wow. or where retrospectively, the blame on an individual during an accident could be attributed to the emotional state that the technology says that they had at that time. And the thing is, Brett, is like, you've got to think about this, okay? If I'm driving, let's say I've got resting angry face, right? Which I mean, I sort of... <laughs> I often look like I'm chewing on a wasp. So I mean, like... that's a nice way to put it. I've been accused of that, but like in a much more gregarious way, but I get sure. it. Okay. So say I've got a resting angry face and this technology says, okay, uh, in that moment, you, when you ran down that pedestrian, you were clearly showing signs of anger. And I say, no, I mean, I wasn't I, like, I wasn't, I felt, um, you know, I, I felt 
perplexed or I felt confused or I felt, you know, whatever other emotion, then then who gets the ultimate say? You know, you, you're, you're entering a world where there is no, no ground truth. And yet we are handing over authority to these automated systems. And sometimes I do think that's a good thing. I think that there is a, a really a fantastic place for algorithms to, to embed themselves in all aspects of, of, yeah. of our world and really genuinely improve things and genuinely make the world better. Like I really do fully, fully believe that. But I think that unless we have these conversations now about where should be off limits and and where the, our lines of comfort and discomfort are, then I think that that actually we can end up causing kind of problems for ourselves further down the line. Yeah, that's all very fascinating. That could be really bad for some people, <laughs> depending on where you hmm. live, especially if you're in like New York traffic, California <laughs> traffic. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I you're just, I was talking to, I was talking to one of the guys who's like creating this technology and I was like, okay, so could you, could it be a situation where like you're angry, the car won't turn on? And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's technically possible. And I was like, okay, so then what if, right? Let's imagine a scenario where someone, um, like kicks your dog, right. And you have to take your dog to the vet and you get in the car and you're really angry because someone's just kicked your dog but it's also an emergency and you've got to like get your dog to the vet and it's like how does how do you I mean you can't code that kind of nuance I mean I know I remember where it's like a slightly ridiculous example no but, but it makes sense to play with wow. these ideas and you cover this in so many more fascinating topics obviously there is a case to be made for people to want to watch this if there was a big takeaway or overarching theme that you hope people get, what would that be? I think it's that, I think it's that everyone needs to be invited to the table. I think that's really what it is for me because, you know, I've been doing, um, especially in the UK, I've been doing maths communication, which is sort of a, <laughs> it's sort of a boring way to describe it, but essentially talking about, um, the importance and the prevalence of, of mathematics yeah. for a really long time. And I think the thing that I've really noticed over and over and over again is just how traumatized lots of adults are over their high school experience yes. with, um, with, with, you know, maths and science. And I think, um, and I think that because of that, because people have this like block almost around these subjects it means that when questions come up about what their role should be in society they tend to shy away from them it's almost like you know all oh, the clever people over there are doing it and I don't really want to get involved but then what I've also noticed is that there are other people maybe people who don't necessarily have good motives who notice this in others and then use equations as a weapon right you will use like graphs and data to obfuscate and to intimidate rather than than to clarify and to illuminate and and i and i really that it really bugs me a lot that when yeah. that happens and so I think that this program, I mean, look, you know, I am a, a mathematician. You will not see a single number or a single equation or me talking about a single number or a single equation in the series. It's there. Like, believe me, it's all there. But it's 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 in the same way as it's invisible in your, the mathematics is invisible in your mobile phone or it's invisible in your satellite TV. Right. Like you do not need to understand the maths to be able to use these ideas and like to, to engage. And so the point of this show really is like, let me do all of the kind of the masking of the technical stuff that feels potentially intimidating. And let me shine a light on the bit that's really important. And it, the bit that's really important for you to have an opinion on, because this is ultimately your future as well as it is mine. Yes. Making math fun. I think that is really a good summation and also preparing us and not weaponizing for what the future brings and how we can take out those predispositions that we might have. As you mentioned, having bad experiences, saying math sucks basically without saying mm. it and mm. really going, okay, how can we look at this in a, an objective sort of way? Again, you cover some really important topics in the series. Now that brings me to the next part of this conversation that I want to address because I have an eight-year-old, we're in math, we've got common core math, 
math is not fun. <laughs> what would one say to the idea of approaching math, teaching children? Well, let me back up. Are you familiar with the common core math system that <laughs> has existed? Uh, maybe in some places less so much as it is now. What mm -hmm. thoughts do you have on that? I'm sure you've been asked about it before a dozen times, but it's a different audience. And I think mm -hmm. my listeners mm -hmm. and viewers might be interested in a soundbite on that because mm -hmm. the way I learned math and the way my eight-year-old learns math are not the same. It's completely no. different. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that there is something that's very, that makes maths education. I keep saying maths, forgive me. I'm going to correct myself every time. That's okay, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is I actually think the American way is better. I mean, okay. you don't say it, like it's clearly not plural, right? It's clearly not like you don't say maths are good, right? <laughs> They're like math is good. <laughs> okay. So I, you know, I'm actually on board with the math thing. Um, okay, so I think that there is something that's fundamentally difficult about um about math education, which is that you are essentially creating the building blocks to to be able to explore. You're sort of your 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 starting from the very foundations and it's so sequential that if you miss out on one block or if one block didn't quite make sense to you it means that everything that that um that comes after it just feels unachievable just feels like it's very difficult and so i think that um that that need to like establish those foundations uh, probably when you uh, learned math, uh, uh, certainly when I learned math, it was about rote learning. It was about repetition. It was about forcing those ideas in over and over and over and over again until they were frankly quite boring, right? I mean, look, I am a uh, a, a professional mathematician and I, I mean, there's lots of stuff that happened in my high school education that is just like, I would not be able to sit through despite my unending like thirst for this subject um and i think that a lot of different things have been tried uh you know not just here but like around the world really a lot of different things have been tried in order to get around that 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 stumbling block that you have to you start with the basics and i think that i mean there are different techniques there's like math mastery there's like there's singapore maths is like one other technique i mean there's lots of different ways that you can go about it to try and like um, to try and just spark that motivation, which then drives the learning rather than than doing it by rote. But I think for me, I think that the big, big, big thing that I have seen, and I, this is anecdotal, right, rather than evidence-based, but I think the biggest thing that I noticed that works is where you just allow people to feel okay with being uncomfortable with maths. I think that is really the big thing. Like if I showed you a, a page of Japanese, right? Or Greek and asked you what it said, you like, I mean, I'm working on the assumption here that you're not fluent in, in those languages. No, you're good. Like, you're sorry. perfectly fine. <laughs> no, you would see that page and you would be like, well, I've got no idea what it, what it means. But you wouldn't feel bad about not, know, not knowing what, what it means because you haven't learned it yet. So ov obviously you don't know what it means. And I sort of think that somehow we've got into our heads that you that there's only two types of people. There's the type of people who see that page of a foreign language and immediately understand it. And those are the mathematicians. And then there are the people who see it and are terrified. And those are the non-mathematicians. And the reality is that, like, no, I mean, I have... As I said, right, I'm a professional mathematician. I still see a page of math and like that I haven't seen before and slightly like clam up in fear that I don't understand it. Of course, I don't understand it. I haven't learned it yet. And I, and I do really think that the biggest thing that you can teach people is to give yourself a break when you don't understand something because you're not supposed to. And underlining the idea that mathematicians are not the people who find maths easy. They are not the people who find equations come naturally to them they are the people who are comfortable with with how hard it is they are the people who enjoy and relish the challenge and so I think that if you can instill in young children this idea that everything that is is worth feeling good about you have to fight for is that there is pleasure in the struggle and is that 
being frustrated in not knowing the answer is not a reflection on your your intellectual capability but purely a reflection on the difficulty of the external like of the subject external to you and your intelligence i think we need to get out of this habit of thinking that not getting something immediately is a a a, a comment on our ability I love it. Well, one last question in that area, and then we'll wrap here with the series. To the parent who struggles and has a child with ADHD or dyscalculia where they've been tested and they look at math and it's just a big jumble and you are a parent myself Mm -hmm. who has a child that's been diagnosed with these things and it's a real thing, scientifically based, based on a set of tests, what approaches work best with taking this math at a third or fourth grade level and really digging your feet in and and doing your best to help the child understand, but also not blow up with frustration? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I think the sitting down calmly and quietly with a pen and paper and doing a, a long list of exercises is always going to be difficult. I think it's difficult for all kids, frankly, but I but I think it's especially difficult for neurodivergent kids um, who who uh, aren't, aren't nat- you know those who are not naturally predisposed, perhaps to that. The thing is, is that I think that um, there is so much more to math than just being able to do a series of exercises. You know, I have kids that are perhaps slightly younger than yours, but you know, there are things that I do with them where I get a series of jam jars, right? And, or jelly, no wait, what do you call it? Like, what do you put on toast? Strawberry jelly. Jelly jam, Um, yes. (laughs) You're okay. Okay. Uh, A a series of jars and a series of lids. And I sit down and say, okay, what do you think is gonna go with what? Without trying it, what do you think will go with what? And why? You know, why do you think, see if you can match them up and then let's see if you get them right. Or, um, or, you know, because because it's not just about writing stuff down, right? It's about it's about spotting patterns. It's about looking for reasons for things. It's about constructing logic. Like that, I think, is so much a part of what it means to be a mathematician. You know, way more than like being good at, men, you know, at mental arithmetic. But I think on that point of like, addition and subtraction one thing that I do with my daughter is I get a really long piece of paper like um you know the packages that Amazon parcels get wrapped in right like there's long bits of brown paper and I lay it out on the floor and we draw a number line on it and then I'll have something that she's interested in like maybe bits of lego or like sometimes maybe even sweets like if it's a special occasion or candy sorry (laughs) like self-translating as I go still and what we'll do is we'll like do the jump, you know, kind of on the number line, it'll be like, right, what's five plus four and do it as jumps or like set up, you know, you can essentially play uh, beer pong, <laughs> um, but without any beer, <laughs> but instead with like little equations in cups where you're like bouncing balls into things. I think it's about making it a playground. I think it's about bringing as much delight and enjoyment to the subject as you possibly can. And I think that in young children, in under, in kids under 10, that is just as important, if not more important than making sure that they get the like, you know, memorize your times tables. I think that, I think instilling a joy of learning is something that will last a lifetime. Wow. This has been one of the most fascinating conversations I've had. And I've talked to some really great people, your present company included, I think this show is important. People will love it. Uh, And I think if you are one listening or watching who concerns himself with the future, you're scared about what might happen. We're preparing ourselves in a very effective way with this show with, with uh, Hannah. It, it premieres the 22nd, which is in just a couple of days on Bloomberg. You have several episodes. It's very exciting. And I cannot wait for people to watch this. Thank you so much for your time. I think that people will really enjoy this show and you seem very excited about it, which is great. I think people will like it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Brett. I really appreciate it. Thank you.